Hi and welcome to chapter 19, Contrast Media and Special Radiographic Techniques. In this chapter we will be looking at various types of contrast media and how it looks on the radiographs and some specialty areas that you'll be using this type of contrast media in. So throughout the chapter, we're going to look at that contrast media, the types of adverse responses to contrast media injections that can take place, what your role is during these procedures, and what you need to look for during and after the exam. So contrast media, when we're taking a look at air gases, just one thing to keep in mind, we are dealing with negative contrast agents. And with this, remember that the mass density or atomic weight of these substances is going to determine the degree of attenuation that occurs in your patient. So air and gases are very light. They are absorbed quickly by x-rays. They are going to have significantly lesser degree than do soft tissues, which is going to result in the gases having a black or very dark or increased density surrounding the structures. This appearance is going to be referred to as a negative contrast agent. So preferably um, things such as air, gases, these are all considered negative contrast agents. When we're looking at certain exams, so arthrograms, myelograms for page patients, we do need to find out if they have an allergy to iodinated contrast material, and we're going to talk about some of those side effects that can occur during the exam later on. So with an iodinated media, those are positive agents, and these are mostly your organs, blood vessels. They're going to have x-ray absorption characteristics that are pretty similar to soft tissue. They cause the radiographic images to have a pretty distinct look, so it makes them visible. So things that you normally wouldn't notice become visible. So we can see this with like the kidneys. So you typically wouldn't see those on a radiograph, but when you insert the contrast media, then those tissues do light up and you're able to see those structures of that kidney. So positive contrast agents such as barium sulfate, iodine compounds, those are going to absorb more radiation than the surrounding tissues, and they're going to have a white or light radiographic density. So we would refer to this as a decrease in density with compared to the surrounding structures around them. There are some, some terms that you should be familiar with when we're looking at ionated media characteristics. Osmolality refers to the number of particles in a solution per kilogram. We also have a term called ionic or non-ionic. Ionic compounds dissociate into those charged particles in the bloodstream and non-ionics do not break down. So typically if we have a patient who has a allergy to a contrast media, we'll use a non-ionic because it doesn't break down those particles. Viscosity is a term that we use to measure the resistance of fluid to the flow. So our contrast precautions that you should be familiar with. Um, in your studies, just realize you do need to ob obtain informed consent. So there will be a form that your patient will have filled out saying, yes, I can have this procedure done. We want to obtain accurate uh, medical history. We want to really focus on allergies. There's certain questions like, have you had a previous exam that you've had a reaction to before? There may be a question in regards to shellfish allergies that you need to ask. So there will be a list at your institution that will say you need to ask these questions and then you'll go through and check off what the patient has said and then determine are we going to continue with this study or not. Some things your patient may not be aware of. So if we are looking at renal failure, we want to check and look at blood urea nitrogen levels, which are called your bun levels, and creatine levels. So before you even do an IV, um, IVU, you want to take a look at those levels in the patient's chart. So your blood urea nitrogen levels, the normal range is typically 6 to 20 milligrams. Um, then your cretin levels are usually about 1.5. If they're over 2.0, that may um, 
be a reason to cancel those exams because again you don't want them to go into renal failure. So typically if we're not sure we'll call up to the nursing station and we'll ask you know the cretin levels are showing this can you find out from the doctor if he wants to proceed with this procedure or not. You also need to verify any medications that your patient is on. So patients with diabetes the, um, they're kind of predisposed to having renal failure. So we want to make sure that they don't have any renal complications. So it's really important to identify if the patient has diabetes, if they're on any medications, and what are they, what are they for, and then decide if you're going to proceed with that, again, exam. If you're not sure, especially if it's a diabetic patient who's had medication um, within the last 48 hours, you will want to call up to the desk and find out, can we proceed with this exam or not? So some checklists for your, your patient. We do want to find out if they've had a history of kidney disease or kidney failure. If they're inpatient, we're going to take a look at the chart and we'll take a look at these bun and creatine levels. Again, your hospital may have specific criteria for those, and so they may be different from institution to institution. So find out what their requirement is for the bun creatine levels. So the book has a recommendation, but that doesn't mean that that's the recommendation for your hospital. Do they have a history of diabetes? If so, what type of medication did they have? History of heart disease, hypertension, so you may want to check their current blood pressure. Did they have another iodine um, study in the last 48 hours? So if they've had even something like a CT or an MRI with contrast media, that could prevent you from seeing what you need to see in the radiograph, so it may be easier to uh, postpone that exam rather than doing it currently. Any history of allergies, especially the shellfish, um, have they had a previous exam to contrast media that they've had a reaction? Do they have a history of asthma? Um, previous allergic reactions to that contrast media, if so what did they have an allergy to? And if they're on any current medications, especially any beta blockers, hypertensive medications, those types of things we want to find out and make note of. So some contrast media reactions that can occur there is um, pretty common reactions. So these are pretty mild reactions. These are things that uh, we aren't too concerned about and we let the patient know. So a common reaction would be feeling of warmth, flushing, they may have a metal taste in their mouth, they may have nausea, vomiting, or coughing. This is something that we just watch for. So we will continue on with that um, exam and we're not too concerned because we've let them know this is what to expect, this is normal during this exam, and we're just going to watch to make sure that they don't um, get to the point where it becomes more severe or that they're going to vomit. So you have a range from mild to severe. Uh, there are no predictors, so your patient may be fine and then all of a sudden they have a reaction. So the, the pretty typical one is a common reaction, but again, it could get worse and so we want to watch for any symptoms while we're doing the exam. So again, mild contrast reactions, we don't really worry too much about these. These are pretty typical reactions that your patient's going to have. But if now they're con concerned, they're having um, anything from bronchiospasm, if they're having erythema, urticaria, those are types of things that we want to give an antihistamine to. So maybe they're starting to develop the hives. And so if they're starting to develop hives, typically if we give them the antihistamine, that's going to um, cause that reaction to not occur. Then we have where we become a little more concerned with the um, vaso reactions. So these are more intermediate. Your patient's complaining of hypotension, so the blood pressure's falling, they have bradycardia. You want to, really want to put your patient into a supine position, elevate those feet, um, elevate the head if their breathing's a problem, and then again you're going to call for some help. The most concern is are they going to have an anaphylactic shock? So do they have a reaction that's going to be severe? So this is where now they're warm, they're tingling, they've got itching on their palms and soles, but now they're complaining about difficulty breathing. So they, they can't grab their breath. 
So are they going to have a respiratory arrest? Are they going to have cardiac arrest? Are they going to have a seizure on the table? So this is something where you want to maintain your airway, call a code, um, and then you need to get the code team in so that they can administer the proper drugs to help the person in that situation. Okay, so your contrast exams, depending on the urinary system that you're looking at, we do have an IVU, which is an intravenous urogram. Most places will call this intravenous pilogram, but the study that they're really doing is an IVU. So the terminology is not appropriate for the study of, that they're really doing. So we're going to teach you the proper name, which is IVU, but when you get out there, don't be surprised if your site's calling it IVP. So this is an example of what that image looks like. You can see the kidneys, the ureter, down to the bladder. So the bladder is starting to fill up with a contrast injection. I do have a couple videos for you to watch in order to understand what the procedure is about. And you are going to learn more about that procedure next semester when you have Cindy's class and you're doing the IVUs um, for her with the abdominal work. Cystograms are another one. This is where we're taking a look at the bladder. So we're injecting a, the bladder with water-soluble iodine through an urinary catheter. It's typically done through fluoroscopies. You do, do some radiographs, and sometimes they'll do a vo voiding cystogram, which is a VCUG, which is a study of them voiding the, the bladder, or emptying those contents. So this is an example, example of a cystogram. You can see the bladder is nice and full with that contrast media, and this is the Foley catheter. Retrograde urography is usually done under cystoscopy, so there is a camera that's placed in to the ureters, and then they can visualize what's taking place at um, the kidney level. So they're looking at those kidney pelvises and calluses. They're looking at the ureters. So this procedure has a lower risk of contrast medium injection because they do have a camera that they're putting up. But instead of an IVU, this may be done if it's um, something where you know that they have contrast sensitivity or poor renal function. So this again, retrograde urography is what they're looking at with this blockage right through here. Biliary system, we can take a look at those biliary ductal systems. We typically use ultrasound MRI or an ERCP. So one of the things that I encourage you is to get up to those ERCPs. They're typically done in a department next to yours, and you can go and actually see these being done. T2 collapsiograms, again, all of these are things that you're going to learn next semester in greater detail. Just be familiar with the terms. Um, this is something we're going to take a look at the common bile duct. And a T-tube is generally a drainage tube that's placed in after surgery uh, that requires the removal of the gallbladder. So this is what this looks like. Endoscopic retrograde, colanopanthiocrethography. So this is your ERCP, which is an endoscope, which is like a camera that's being placed down the back of the patient's throat. So that endoscope's pass through the mouth down the throat into the stomach. And then a small catheter is passed through that scope to the distal end of the common bile duct. And then contrast is injected. And they do do spot films or digital images that they're going to capture. Some other types of exams that you may see myelograms are ones that are done of the spinal canal. So we're taking a look if there's any tumors. Do they have a disc that's herniated? Something that's pressing against the spinal cord um, that's causing back pain. So I do have, again, some examples of those videos for you to watch so that you get a better idea of what those studies entail. Arthrograms with contrast. Um, typically, we're doing these mostly in CT and MRI now, um, but you will take a look at contrast exams with the synovial joint structures if you do these in your department. All right, I hope you have a great rest of your week. Thank you.